Facebook account so I can see any comments. And I'm going to pull up the, um, let me just make a text here real quick. Let everybody know that we are going live. So I'm using an, uh, an application that I can't see the um, Facebook page, but I'm going to look up right here right now and see if I can see myself live. This is all new options that we're working on here. New day. Give me just a second to get everything set up. Alrighty. Okay. Give me just a minute. I'm trying to get everything set up here. Hmm. Okay. Uh, if you're if you've logged into Facebook, with if you would uh, please just put a comment, say hello, I'm here, and I'm going to see if it shows up in my box here on my screen that I'm looking at. Now for St. Andrews, let's see, I'm subscribed. Go home in just a minute. <clears throat> We're also on um, Facebook, so those that are on Facebook can watch it. There we go. I'm live. If you see me on Facebook, if you'll put something in the comment, you have to be logged in on Facebook. Um, Facebook account, and then you can log a comment. I do believe the comments are on because I, I wanted this to be interactive. I didn't want to just do a upload a video and um, just upload a video and <clears throat> not have any action. Okay, let's see here. Um, it's like I may be frozen here. Maybe that. Okay. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. All right, um, so it looks like I am seeing a couple of people that are live right now. Uh, let's see. Okay. All right. I'm learning on how to do all this. So I can see uh, Victoria Reeves have signed on. She's on, looks like YouTube. Ashley Reeder says I'm here. Uh, Marty Cohn uh, is on Facebook. We've got Nikki Chan is on Facebook. Uh, Glenda. Uh, and others, so very good. All righty. Give just another minute or two to get everybody logged on here. All right. Wow. I'm, uh, if you hear something squeal behind me every now and then, it's not an automobile. I'm here at the church, so it's not an automobile coming through the church. It's the air conditioners cutting on and off. Um, hard to believe here we are this far in March and we're already needing our air conditioners at the end of the day. All righty. So what I wanted to do tonight, all right, I see Tammy says here, I'm here. Sounds good. Very good. Uh, she's coming in from Facebook. Thank you very much. For those of you that didn't, for those of you that did not know, we had a, um, Facebook channel, we do. And if you will help us, you can still watch it on Facebook tonight. But if you just make a little note to go to YouTube and look up stapc.com, stapc.com, or not stapc.com, just look up stapc. You see our logo up here in the top corner of the, uh, of the video that you're watching. Just type in stapc in the YouTube search. You'll see our icon. Click on that icon and subscribe. Uh, that will help us. All right. Very good. Okay. So uh, let's open with a word of prayer before we get started. And we're going to dive into uh, a Bible study that I think is very pertinent for what we're facing. Father, thank you. Oh, I just want to thank you for the blood of Jesus. 
God, even in, even in days that uh, are frustrating and uh, aggravating, and man, it's just uh, just one of those days that all we got to do is stop and steal ourselves, get in your presence, and Lord, you minister to us. We can weep before you, we can pour out our complaint before you, and you're there. You're touching us, and I thank you for that, God. I needed that to my, in my own life today, and you did it, Father, and I thank you for that. Now, Holy Spirit, I ask you to lead us and guide us in this study tonight because you're the only one that reveals truth. I can't reveal truth. Only you can, Holy Spirit. So as we look into the word tonight, Holy Spirit, lead us and guide us. Let our hearts be encouraged. Um, let us have direction and insight. And we just thank you, Father, all these things will happen in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. So one of the questions that I've heard circulated is, is the COVID-19 God's judgment uh, on this world? And another question that goes right along with that is, is COVID-19 one of the signs uh, of Jesus' coming very soon? Well, let me address that question first. And the answer is yes. As I've studied the Bible for over 30 years, I have found, let me get my Bible out here. As I've studied the Bible for over 30 years, I've studied it not based upon me being a part of a particular denomination. I've studied the Bible for what does the Bible say? Uh, and the reason why I'm part of the Assemblies of God is because it is the denomination that I have found that lines up most with the Word of God than any other denomination that I've seen. I'm not saying other denominations are wrong. I'm just saying for me and what I read in the Bible, uh, that's why I'm a part of the Assemblies of God. There is a prophecy in the book of Daniel. It's called Daniel's 70 Weeks. This 70-week prophecy was divided into three, three parts. It had uh, X number of weeks and X number of weeks, and those two combined equaled 69 weeks. Each week in Daniel's prophecy, seven days represents seven years. When you go back to the prophecy uttered in Daniel, um, from the time it was uttered till the time of the 69th week's completion, takes you up to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Um, because in the middle of that, in that end of that 69th week prophecy, it says the Messiah is cut off. That's the crucifixion. There is a time period in between the 69th week and the 70th week, because we're long past seven years of Jesus' crucifixion. It's been almost 2,000 years now since Jesus was crucified. So there's a time period there. In the Bible, when you see the term uh, latter days in most of the time or the end times, uh, the, that represents the time period we're in right now. From the crucifixion of Christ to the time of the rapture, that is the time that we're living in right now. That's why we believe in the... Um, imminent return of Jesus Christ. That means he could come at any time. The apostle Paul was looking for Jesus to come because he could come at any time. When Daniel's 70th week begins, the book of Revelations chapter five begins. So we're in the book of Revelations as a church. We're in the first three chapters. We're living the first three chapters out right now in the book of Revelations. When the rapture of the church takes place, the church is raptured week. And the book of Revelations, the tribulation period, is divided into two parts, the tribulation period and the great tribulation period. And all of that equals seven years. And Daniel's 70th week is seven years. But Jesus, there are going to be signs contractions, if you will, like a woman giving birth. The closer she comes to birth, the closer the contractions are. So when you look at what Jesus said in, in Matthew chapter 24, and he's talking about the signs of the times, and, and perhaps when we're done with the Christ, uh, we'll do the study again on the book of Revelations. I did that about five years ago. What was I talking about? Anyway. So these are signs, contractions. The closer the tractions can get, the closer we are to the rapture of the church. 
The Bible's clear. We don't know when the rapture is going to take place. The Father in heaven has reserved that knowledge for him alone. But it is coming. We see the signs. Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, uh, earthquakes in various places, and pestilence. So COVID-19 is a pestilence. And that's just another sign of the time. Think about the, the things that have happened throughout human history since Jesus said those words that is penned in Matthew chapter 24, which was penned probably within 50 years of Jesus actually saying those words. There's been plagues that have, that have went through the planet. We've seen earthquakes, disastrous earthquakes that have taken place in the first and second centuries. Uh, wars, crusades, all these things. But the, they've happened in human history, but they were further apart. But the closer we get to the coming of Christ, the closer and closer these events happen. Frequently. Just think in the, last in the last hundred years, we've had the First World War. We've had the Second World War. We've had the Korean conflict. We've had the Vietnam War. We've had the Gulf War. We've had a second Gulf War. We've had the war on terrorism. So they're getting closer and closer together. More and more earthquakes. More. So yeah, it's getting closer. The first question is, that we asked earlier, is COVID-19 God's judgment? So we're going to talk about that. Is that God's judgment? So I'm going to switch over here to some notes that I've got. If, if you've got a Bible app handy, uh, you can uh, look at it like. And again, if you have a comment, you know, uh, about what I'm saying, if you put it in the comments, I hope that I can see it. There might be some lag questions. Um, so judgment for the Christian. Well, first of all, do we believe that God will bless the Christians? Well, yeah, we believe God wants to bless Christians. Absolutely. Without question, God wants to bless us. And Nothing wrong with seeking God's blessings. So if we believe God will bless us, then why do we find it hard to believe that God will judge his children? Now, I'm not going to I don't want to I do not want to invoke unnecessary fear for the Christian. But I do hope to bring some sobriety, a sober living, if you will. Um, we're all aware that judgment is coming in eternity. And in eternity, there's two judgments. There's the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we all must appear, and Paul is writing to Christians here, we all must appear in the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what has been done, whether good or bad. So there's the judgment seat of Christ. From my understanding of reading scriptures, this judgment is only for Christians. No, no sinners will be there. Every person that is a judgment seat of Christ is going to make it to heaven. Uh, Paul talks about it in, I think, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He talks about how that the, the day our works are going to be judged in the fire. And that's the judgment. Uh, the hay, wood, and stubble of our life will be burned up so that 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 remains pure will remain. And he talks about that some people are going to make it to heaven by the skin of their teeth. So this, these are believers. Um all of them are going to go to heaven. Whew. Now, there's a second judgment. It's called the great white throne judgment. And that's found in, in Revelations, I believe, chapter 20. In this great white throne judgment, uh, all the sinners are called before God. Now, up until that time, all sinners are held in the place called hell. Hades, uh, in some of the Greek translations. But it's hell. It's a, it's a holding place. It's like if, if a, somebody murders someone, they're caught red-handed murdering someone, they're put in jail, and they await their trial. And at their trial, they're found guilty, uh, and then they're sentenced. Their sentence is carried out in prison. So hell is the jail, if you will. They're brought before God at the great white throne judgment. These are all sinners. Uh, there is no hope for them. And that's, that's, a, that's a, it's a heavy tragedy when you think about it. It's a heavy tragedy. But once they are sentenced, they are cast into the lake of fire. And the lake of fire is the second death. It talks about in Revelation. In Matthew, I think it's in chapter 24, 25. Uh, I think it's chapter 25. When it talks about the unjust shall be cast into the lake of fire. 
So the lake of fire is the final resting place uh, of those who don't believe. And that's a heavy thing, but it just weighs on my heart right now thinking about it. But it's a real reality. Okay, so we're all aware of eternal judgment. All right. So for the Christian, understand this about eternal judgment. Love, which comes from God, God is love. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. In other words, Christ is in us. We're going to make it to heaven. We don't have to fear that eternal judgment. So Christian, do not fear any eternal judgment. You walk in obedience to God. So now let's get back to the question. I'm leading up to the COVID-19, believe it or not. But we got to lay a foundation here. What about in the life as a Christian? Will we receive judgment from God in this life? I mean, I know that we face the judgment seat of Christ. But what about now before we die? You know, will we face any of God's judgment now <clears throat> as a believer? Well, uh, Acts chapter 5, verse number 1. Um, there's a husband and wife named Ananias and Sapphira. Acts chapter 5. Brief story, if you're not familiar with that story. Ananias, Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, there was a big thing. A lot of people in the church, land, I should say. They were bringing all of that money they had sold and, and giving it to the church. Uh, and so Ananias and Sapphira sold a piece of property. And let's just say they sold it for $100,000. Well, they kept back $25,000 for themselves. And they gave $75,000. Well, when you read the story, the sin wasn't because they kept the money back. Peter said, when you had it in your power, you could do what you want to with it. The problem was they presented it as, hey, this is how much we got for our property. We got 75000 so we're given 75000 And they lied. Well, in the, in the story of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5, Peter called him on the carpet and said, you've not, not lied to God. God judged him. He died. Right there on the spot. A few hours later, his wife comes in. Same thing. Boom. Judgment. She died right there on the spot. Okay. Say, so, well, maybe they weren't really believers. Maybe they were faking it. Yeah. Okay. So let's go to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In fact, let's go there. If you have your Bibles, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. Um, he, he does a lot of corrective teaching in the book of Corinthians. And so let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's go down. Um, verse 17. Now, in giving these instructions, I come together. Let me go down a little bit more. Okay. There must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, supper, isn't it? it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, one takes his own supper ahead of another. One what? Do you not have? Offices, how eat and drink, or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What I shall say, what shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? And I think not. For as I receive from the Lord, I also deliver to you. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, said, Take ye, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. What does the Lord's death proclaim? The Lord's death proclaims that you were a sinner and Christ had to die for you. So sin is a very heavy issue. But Christ willingly died for you and gave himself for you so that you can have forgiveness of sins. His body was broken for you so that you could have healing, healing spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Now watch what Paul says in verse number 27. And we're asking the question, does God bring judgment upon believers? 
verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Verse 29. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Oh, that's kind of heavy here now. He who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment unto himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Verse 30, for this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Literally, many have died. Now, who's Paul talking to? He's not talking to, to the sinner. He's talking to Christians. He's talking about believers who apparently have sin in their life, and they flippantly take the Lord's body through communion, and they keep living in sin. They're, they're not accepting, they're not living out what they received in Christ. Wow. And because of that, sickness has come upon them. Many have become weak, maybe weak in their faith, weak physically. But specifically here, many have died. Many, have, many are asleep. They've died. And then he says, verse 31, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we listen to this. Here's the reason why God judges us. When we are judged as Christians, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Ah. So it appears that God does judge believers in this life. 1 Peter 4.17 says, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? But even Peter is saying judgment begins in the house of God. He's talking about among the body of believers. Unforgiveness brings God's judgment without question. Jesus said in the model prayer in Matthew chapter 6 verse 12, he says, and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. Verse 14 says, and if you forgive men their trespasses, their sins, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins against you, neither will your heavenly father forgive your sins. So judgment is back on. Wow. Um, and then Galatians chapter 6. This is for everybody. The believer and the non-believer. Uh, Galatians 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he's going to also reap. He sows to the flesh, or the flesh reap corruption. He sows to the spirit, or the spirit reap everlasting life. Therefore, let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we not, do not lose heart. So, whenever we violate one of God's, violate God's words, there's going to be consequences to the violation of that. We're sowing to the flesh. And we're going to, of the flesh, reap death and corruption. We sow to the Spirit, we reap life and life everlasting. So here's the thing. Whenever God brings judgment upon the believer, it's chastening. Now, go with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Now, I haven't forgot the question, is COVID-19 God's judgment? I haven't forgot that. We're building up to that. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, man, we got that very familiar passage of scripture. I've quoted it many, many times um, at funerals. Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily ensnare us, entangle us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him. What was that joy? Our salvation. Our salvation, when it's his joy set before him, he endured the suffering of the cross, despising its shame. And now he's at the right hand of the father. OK, we love that passage of scripture. But let's go on to the next verse of scripture. Chapter 12, verse three of Hebrews. For consider Christ, him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, 
lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. In other words, hey, they come against Jesus, they're going to come against you. Yet you have not resisted the bloodshed striving against sin. In other words, you, you're not trying to pay for your sins through your own blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons? My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, the discipline of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as a son. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if, but if you are without chastening, you have been, you, which we've all come partakers of, you are illegitimate. In other words, if God's not disciplining you, then you're not his child. God disciplines his children. Why? Because he loves us. What's the purpose of discipline? The purpose of discipline, it, obviously, if we're doing something that's a sin, he's going to discipline us for that. But also, he allows hard times to come into our life to grow our faith. Therefore, verse number 12, strengthen the hands that hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet. So what is lame might not be dislocated, but rather healed. Here the exhortation is, okay, if God has showed you the path that you're on is the wrong path and you're feeling the discipline of God on it, get on the right path because you're going to be healed on the path of righteousness. Okay, so. God's judgment. Is COVID-19 God's judgment? Well, when God does judge, even in the midst of his judgment, he's always looking for repentance. Always, 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 always. The, the city of Nineveh. God's judgment was coming upon the city of Nineveh, and he sent Jonah to warn them. Jonah warned them. God relented because the people repented. Is COVID-19 God's judgment? Well, there are, there are some who say that since the cross of Jesus Christ, from, from that time until the time the tribulation period begins, in that time period that we're in right now, God does not use natural disasters for judgment. Let me just say in my research and study of the scriptures, can't necessarily say that that's all altogether true. Now, we go back to the Old Testament. We're living in the New Testament. We go back to the Old Testament. We all want to claim the promises of the Old Testament. I mean, why? Why do we want to claim the promises of the Old Testament? Because the old te the promises of the Old Testament were made to the Jews, not to the Gentiles. They were well, some of them were to the Gentiles, but but most of the promises we quote was not spoken to Gentiles. It was spoken to Jews. So why is it that we as Christians today want to claim the promises that God made to the Jews? Well, that's because the Jews were God's people. God called Abraham out from the rest of the world. And when God made a covenant with Abraham, Abraham went from being a Gentile to a Jew. Paul talks about it in his epistles that we Gentiles have been grafted into the vine. And so when we're grafted into the vine, we are heirs and joint heirs with Christ Jesus. The covenant that was made to Abraham, the promises of that covenant we now participate in that covenant. So we want to claim verses like Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. They are thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. That's a promise that was made to the Jews. And we want to claim the promise of Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises against you in judgment, God shall condemn. And this is the heritage of the saints of the Lord. And their righteousness is for me, say the Lord. We want to claim those verses. And we should. Because we are God's children. The promises that God made to the heirs of Abraham apply to us because we've been grafted into the vine. So we want to claim the promises that were made to the Jews. What about, what about the judgments? The 
What about the judgments that God promised to the Jews when they failed to walk in obedience to the MC? God warned the Jews. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, the first, first several verses of Deuteronomy 28 is the blessings. Blessed shall you be in your field. Blessed shall you be in your bedroom. Blessed shall you be here. And everywhere you go, you're blessed, 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 blessed. Why? The precursor of that is if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. All of these blessings will come upon you. And then I think starting in about verse 15 or so, all the curses. And there are more curses listed than there are blessings. And the curses come because God said, if you don't diligently obey my voice, if you don't walk after me, this is what's going to happen. I'll remove my hand of blessing. And when I remove my hand of blessing, the devourer, the enemy is going to come in. So I want you to turn with your, in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. This is very important. Please get your Bible, open up a Bible app. This is very, very, very important. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. As you turn in there, let me give you the backstory of what's happening. And this is Solomon has dedicated the temple unto the Lord. Chapters 5, 6, and 7, I believe all three of those chapters deal with Solomon's dedication of the temple. David, his father, had provided, had wanted to build the temple, but God wouldn't let him because he was a man of blood, a man of war. And God said, your son will build it. So David collected pretty much all the money needed to build the temple. Solomon has dedicated the temple. The glory of God, the fire of heaven came down and consumed the sacrifice. The glory of God filled the temple. A cloud, a physical cloudy presence of God filled the temple. The priest could no longer stand up. They had to fall prostrate in the presence of God. What a phenomenal, phenomenal day it was. And so we pick up in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, not verse 14. Well, let's read verse 14 first, and then we'll go back. Verse 14 says, God said to Solomon, If my people, not the sinners, not the world, but the people who, who I have called my people, Christians, are we God's people? Yes. We want to claim the promises of the Jews. We need to take the admonition that God gives to the Jews. If my people who are called by my name, you name the name of Jesus Christ. If they will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Uh oh. This next part and turn from their wicked ways. He's talking to us Christians, we claim to be the people of God. This verse of scripture applies to us. If they will turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Now let's go back to verse 12. 2 Chronicles 7 verse 12. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. He's talking about the temple. Now look at what, verse God, what God says in verse 13. When the heavens are shut up and there is no rain. Is that what it says in your Bible? No, it doesn't. It shouldn't. Verse 13, this is God speaking. When I, I, God, Jehovah, when I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or I command the locusts to devour the land, or I send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. So let's put some of this together. First of all, God does not create evil. 
James clearly says, James clearly says, when a man is tempted, let him not say I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither does he tempt anyone with evil. When God created this earth, and he stepped back and he declared, everything is good. Earthquakes aren't good. Tornadoes aren't good. Hurricanes are not good. Drought is not good. Fires that consume acres and kill tens of thousands of wildlife animals. That's not good. Pestilence. It's not good. All of these things are a direct result to the fall in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve sinned, it unleashed all of the bad things that are happening. So people say, why isn't God doing something about this? If God was a loving God, why is, why is he allowing, why don't he do something about it? Well, he has done something about it. It's called the cross of his son, Jesus Christ. See, God gave humanity a very sovereign gift. He gave us the choice, the power to make choices. What we do with that power is up to us. Howsoever, because man is sold into sin, we have a veil over our eyes before Christ and we can't see truth. Real truth, because we have a veil. And Paul says those are, when we receive Christ, the veil is removed and we can see clearly. God did not create pestilence. God did not create COVID-19. Could God have? Yeah, he's sovereign. He could do whatever he wants to. But from what I read in his word, this word right here, God didn't create any of that. God can direct these things. Remember whenever Satan appeared before, before God in, in the book of Job? Where have you been? Oh, I've been, walking to and fro, uh, 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 I've been walking to and fro upon the earth. And God said, have you considered my servant Job? And, and Satan said, well, I can't touch him. You've got a hedge of protection around him. <clears throat> Remove that hedge of protection. He'll curse you and die. And so God removed the hedge of protection to allow Satan. We also know that uh, we see in the, in the, I think it's in Chronicles, uh, this meeting with God of um, um, eternal beings. And they asked, how are we going to deceive this king? How is this king going to be led away? And God said, I'll send a lying spirit to the mouth of his prophets. God's the one that sent the lying spirit to the mouth of those prophets so that false prophecy would take place. So God can direct these things. The question is, is COVID-19 God's judgment? I'm not going to say it's not. And I'm not going to say it is. What I will tell you this, it's a very horrible thing, kind of like the Spanish flu, just like the bubonic plague. Those are horrible things. I cannot, I cannot stand up here and pound on the pulpit and say, this is God's judgment upon a sinful world. What's happening in this world is a result of sin. This is, this is nothing compared to the ultimate judgment that's going to happen. But I draw us back to what we just read in Second Corinthians, excuse me, Second Chronicles. We want to claim the promises of the Old Testament. We want, and we should claim them. The promises that God made to the seed of Abraham, we're a part of those promises because we've been grafted into the vine, so we should claim them. But should we not also receive the admonition that God gives, the warnings that God gives to his children in the Old Testament? Yes, we should. You can't Dissect them. They're a part of one another. God says, when I shut up the heaven and there's no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among the people. Church, Christians just like us, we're the ones that have the hope. We, you, you carry in you the gospel of Jesus Christ. You carry hope. What is our hope? Our hope is Christ. and Our hope is in God. <clears throat> you know, uh, the president wants uh, Easter Sunday to be a day that we all get together back together. 
And the world says, well, that's foolish. That can never happen. Well, what if the church prayed? I can't think of a, of a better day to celebrate than Easter Sunday. Wouldn't it be great? Look, I, I, it, it grieved my heart. I watched the news. I don't watch it very frequently. I just watch just enough to, to get the information and to see the people around the globe that are dying from this. And let me tell you something. It's not just <clears throat> sinners that are coming underneath this. See, if this... We've got Christians. Uh, some of you may have seen my post on Facebook. Um, we've got several Assembly of God missionaries. Our top missionary in the Assemblies of God, Greg Mundus, uh, got COVID-19. A lot of our missionaries, several of our missionaries have gotten COVID-19 because they're in regions of the world where it all started. And, and as we now understand, the reason why they're asking people to quarantine themselves if they've come in contact with someone with COVID-19 is because it takes up to 14 days for that thing to run its course. And sometimes you can be infected for three or four or five days and not have any effects, but yet the virus is in you. You know, it's coming out your 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 saliva. It's coming out of your, your uh, nasal uh, places and, and you're touching things and you're infecting people don't even know. And that's, that's why it's so important to practice good hygiene because it's so contagious. So we need to pray. We need to pray. If my people who are called by that, my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, God's face, and if we'll turn from our wicked ways. See, I'm reminded of, of the church of Ephesus in, in uh, Acts, uh, I think it's at 19, 18 or 19. Paul goes into the city of Ephesus, establishes a church there in Ephesus. And then sometime later, the seven sons of Sceva tried to cast out this demon and it wouldn't come out of him and it... The demon jumped on them, says, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know, but who are you? Beats the clothes off of them. And the Bible says, and believers brought their magic books and their things out of this. It wasn't just the sinners that were getting right with God. It was the Christians. They realized, hey, there's some other things in my life that I need to get rid of. I remember when I went to uh, the Million Man March sponsored by Promise Keepers back in the late 90s. Um, you know, me and about 12 guys loaded up in a van and we drove like 12, 14 hours up to Washington, D.C. Uh, I'll never forget that smell riding in that van. I hope I never experience that again. Anyway, I went up there thinking, yeah, I'm going to pray for our president to repent. I'm going to pray for Congress to repent. I'm going to I'm going to pray all these people repent. And when I got up there, I realized it wasn't about calling sinners to repentance. It was about the church getting right. Peter said it's that judgment begins in the house of God. We've got to take a look at our own selves, church. I, I think God wants us to take a look. I, I do believe God is using COVID-19 to get our attention. That I do believe. Whether it's his judgment or not, I'm not going to say, but I do know he's getting our attention with COVID-19. And why is he getting our attention? Because he wants us to turn towards him. The verse of scripture, the promise that we claim in Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the thoughts I think towards you, thoughts of peace and of hope. You know, we want that. The very next two verses tells us how to, how to receive those promises of God. God says, if you'll turn to me with all your heart, you will find me. Man, God has got some wonderful things for his church. I do not believe that right now the church in the world has received everything God wants it to have. I know in the Church of America it's not. And the Church of America needs a fresh touch of God's healing power from sin and all these things that we're dabbling in. We, we need to get right with God. And we have no right to talk to others about getting right if we ourselves don't first say, okay, God, what, what in my life do I need to surrender to you? Remember Hebrews 12. We're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight. Weight is not a sin. It's just something that's keeping us from running as efficiently and effectively as we can. If my people which are called by my name, God told Solomon, 
when bad things are happening in the land, here's what you need to do when bad things are happening in the land, when there's drought, when, when there's uh, no crops, when there's famine, when there's pestilence, if these things are going on in your land, God told Solomon, here's what my people are supposed to do. Humble themselves and pray and seek God's face. So that's what we need to be doing as a church. Okay. Not in fear, not, not in woe is me, but God, we seek your face. We seek your face, oh God. That's what we're doing. Okay. Now I'm going to stop before we pray and I'm going to go back to my other screen here. Um, all right. Do we have any questions? You can. Um, let's see here. Okay. So if you ask a question, it may pop up on the screen for everybody to read. Uh, good evening, everyone. So, Pastor, what is a good way to answer an unbeliever uh, that they ask, why is such a uh, such a loving God as we have doing these things? Well, again, as I as I answered earlier, uh, it's not what God is doing. Uh, it's what sin is doing. And what has God done? God is giving his son, Jesus Christ. God did. God has done something to interfere with sin. And he gave his son and before his son went to the cross, he bore stripes on his back so that we could have uh, forgiveness uh, of sin. So God didn't bring this about. This is a result of sin um, in, in, our, in, in the world. Um, and as Christians, we are to pray for that God will help bring an answer, whether it's through medical science, uh, that God will bring an answer to healing of this. That's a good question. Very good question. Um, Let's see. Any other questions here? You're welcome. Uh, I put that up there. But let's see, because I don't know how to get. I don't. I know how to put the questions up there. Let's see. There we go. All right. Um, you're welcome. Other questions. Going once, going twice. So would you say that God is allowing the devil to do this? Still does. I'm assuming to build this up. Um, that's a good question. I would say this. God can't allow the devil to do this without question. Uh, but the purpose, anytime God allows something to come, He always wants to use it to turn attention to Him. Where is the attention at right now in our society? It's focused on the government. We're looking to the government to help us, We're looking to the government to deliver us for this. And as you can see, the government can't deliver us from this. They're trying, and I pray for them, and I pray for my, my president, I pray for the leaders, because, man, they have a heavy load. And we as the church should support all of our leaders. Without question, this should, should be something our faith in God. Because it's faith, not fear, prayer, not panic, wisdom, not mayhem. Um, so I do know that this is something that God is using to get our attention. Um, th think about all the things we focused on in, in this nation. We focused on our celebrities, our, our star power. We focused on our sports heroes. Well, you can't even go watch the sports. All you can do is go back and watch reruns of old things. People have focused on their money. 
Yeah, if you had money in the stock market, you probably lost a lot of things. And there's some people in retirement. It's like, man, I don't have any retirement money now. So God has taken away our celebrities. He's taken away our sports heroes. He's taken away the money. Maybe God's trying to get our attention. That we realize that our help comes from the Lord. That's a good, good question. I, I, I know that God is using, wants to use this to build us up, by the way. I know he wants to build our faith up. And that's what I pray it does. I, I, don't, I, don't, have, I don't have any fear of the COVID-19. God forbid, but if I got COVID-19 and I died, I still win. Because I'm a child of God. <laughs> Paul said, for me to live is Christ and die is gain. So it doesn't matter. I win any other way. Any other questions? Those are good questions. I appreciate all of you. I look like we got 22 and 11. So that's 33 here in attendance tonight. That's very good. Yes. Thank you so much. Praise God. Amen. Um, I, I have mentioned Greg Mundus to you. Greg Mundus is the, uh, the leader of all of our uh, world missions. Um, and... Um, so we need to be praying for him. Um, yeah, there was another question about um, what are your thoughts on the belief that now is an opportunity to microchip people with the COVID vaccine? Well, um, no, I, I don't. When you start when you start tracking people electronically, that gets a little gets a little dangerous. Uh, I, I think. I think we should keep track of those that have had the COVID-19 so we can make sure that they're not going to be spreading to other places. That's why they should be quarantined until they test negative for it. But putting a chip in them, I don't think that's, uh, you know, is that something the Antichrist is going to use? It's possible. Um, it could be. Uh, I'm not saying it is of the Antichrist. Uh, no more than a computer is of the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to use computers. It's going to use cell phones. It doesn't make it. Uh, something, a product of the Antichrist. So, you know, but I, I'm not getting a chip in me. But one of my dog, okay, but not me. But that's a good question. Thank you for the question. All right, let's pray for, for, for Greg Mundus. Uh, he is the executive leader of the Assemblies of God for World Missions. Ron Maddox is another one. There's a couple of others. And so let's just pray for all of those and of our missionaries that have... Uh, contracted the COVID-19 and, and Father, we just want to thank you that you gave us your promise. It is a promise to the seed and the heirs of Abraham. We are the heirs of Abraham. We have been grafted into the vine by the blood of Jesus. And we're so thankful for that. And God, we just lift up Greg Mundus to you. God, he has been so close to death. And if, and if he died, he still won because he went to be with you. But God, we want him to live. We're asking you, Father, to stretch forth your hand for him, and <clears throat> for Ron Maddox, and for the others, Lord. <clears throat> All our other missionaries, God, that have contracted this. God, we just pray. Stretch forth your hand in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. God, you're looking for people to stand in the gap. Lord, we stand in the gap in prayer <clears throat> for our missionaries. And we stand in the gap, God, for those in Europe, Father, right now that are struggling with life. God, this, this disease, this infection has come upon them, and we just pray for them, God. Oh, mighty God, we release in the name of Jesus your word that by the stripes of your son, they were healed. Oh, God, be merciful, we pray, Father. Be merciful, we pray, God. Lord, we pray for our land, God. <clears throat> we, you said for Christians, for followers of God. And so, Lord, not only is this just relegated to the, to the geographical map called Israel. But now your people are literally all over this globe. Lord, our globe needs a healing. Lord, we ask you, Father, your people, we turn to you, God. Show us things in our own life, God, in my own life. Oh, God, I'm praying that I would yield to your spirit. Even today, God, as I have faced so many things in my life today, 
Lord, I just surrender to you. Holy Spirit, I surrender these weights and these sins that have easily beset me. I lay them aside, God. <clears throat> and your church, we lay these things aside, God, that you would receive glory in our lives. And that as the church of Jesus Christ in America, Lord, we pray for this nation. Oh, God, I pray this nation would turn back to you. That our hearts, the Christians, God, the church would turn their hearts back to you because it is the church that impacts the society. It is light that shines in darkness. And Lord, we remove the lampshades of, of the weights and the sins and the distractions that we've allowed to, to filter the light, God, no more. We remove those things, God, so that the light of Christ will shine clearly in the church to this world and this nation. And this nation, many in this nation, will turn to the light of Jesus Christ that is shining brightly in your children. So, God, we humble ourselves. We turn from our wicked ways. We turn from the sin and the weights that easily ensnare us, Lord. Show us these things, God. Revive us, Father, in the Holy Spirit. Revive us, I pray, God. Let a revival of the Holy Spirit, God, begin to take place. Let it start in my life, God. I don't like where I'm at right now, God, spiritually. There's more, God. There's too many things that are encumbering me. The, the, the stress and the worry and the anxiety. Lord, I, I lay that aside. And I receive your peace, God. I receive your strength, Father. I receive your word and the promises of your word. God, as I go to your word, Father, let it come alive. What needs to cut, let your word cut in my life. What needs to heal, let your word heal in my life. What needs to direct, let it direct. What it needs to correct, let it correct, God. But we open up your word, Holy Spirit of God, bring it alive like never before we pray. In Jesus' name. God, we pray for our president and for the task team, God. Lord, the president said he would like to have uh, gatherings back on Easter Sunday. What a, what a glorious testimony that when the church prayed, God, you heard. You heard when the church prayed. Oh, God, remove this, this pestilence from the land of America, God, we pray. But we pray, God, that you would, if it's a, something that you're wanting to work in this nation, then we pray let your work be done, that people be one to Jesus Christ, we pray. And let your saints live in faith, not fear. Let us, let us pray and not panic. And let us walk in wisdom and not mayhem. In Jesus' name and Holy Spirit, give us wisdom as we interact with those who have questions about God and about these things. Let us be able to tell them the truth, that it is sin that started all this. And God's answer to sin is Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for watching. We will not be meeting together as a congregation this Sunday. We will be live streaming once again this coming Sunday. Uh, only people that will be in the building will be this, the, the bare minimum team needed. The worship team will be here, the media team. Uh, but the rest of us, please join us. Please join us this Sunday at a regular time, 1040. Hey, tell your neighbors, tell your friends, tell your enemies. They can watch us on YouTube or on Facebook, YouTube or Facebook. And you, if you haven't, went to our YouTube channel and subscribed, please go to our YouTube channel. It's S-T-A-P-C. That's our YouTube channel. Subscribe. Uh, it'll help us boost some other things that we need YouTube to cooperate with. So just go there and subscribe. But tell your friends, watch us on Facebook or on YouTube this Sunday. God bless you. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm privileged to be with you tonight. God bless you.